Have you ever thought about what you would do if an EMP attack happened right now? That's a question we should all be asking ourselves. An EMP, or electromagnetic pulse, is a burst of electromagnetic radiation that can knock out electronic devices and power grids, sending us spiraling back into an era devoid of modern conveniences. The silence, the darkness, the sudden halt of our technologically dependent world, it's a chilling thought, isn't it? But how does an EMP occur? It's not as far-fetched as you might think. An EMP can be triggered by a high-altitude nuclear detonation, where the blast sends out an energy wave capable of frying electronic circuits within its reach. Picture a city plunged into darkness, not by a power outage, but by a devastating wave that leaves us helpless in its wake. And it's not just man-made threats we need to be wary of. Even the sun, the source of life on Earth, can unleash a massive solar flare with enough energy to trigger an EMP. Imagine a bolt of solar energy streaking across space and colliding with our planet, causing a global blackout. It's happened before, in the 19th century, and it could happen again. So what makes this threat real and urgent? Increasing global tensions coupled with our over-reliance on electronic systems and vulnerable power grids, that's a recipe for disaster. Our world is more interconnected than ever, and while that brings us closer, it also leaves us exposed. Our satellites orbiting the Earth, our power lines crisscrossing our cities, even the devices we carry in our pockets, they're all potential casualties in an EMP event. It's easy to dismiss this as mere fear-mongering, but awareness is our first line of defense. Understanding the threat, acknowledging its likelihood, that's the first step towards preparedness. Now that you understand the threat, what's your next move when an EMP hits? It's a question that could mean the difference between chaos and survival. Let's dive deeper into this, shall we? The clock is ticking, and every second counts when you're prepping for tomorrow. So, the lights go out. How can you be sure it's an EMP? It's a question that might keep you up at night, but don't worry, we've got answers. First, consider the circumstances. An EMP event would likely be sudden and widespread. If your power flickers off while the neighbor's lights are still shining bright, you're probably dealing with a local outage. But if everything goes dark at once and you can't get a dial tone on your landline or a signal on your cell phone, you might be dealing with something bigger. Remember, an EMP won't just knock out your power. It will disable anything with a microchip from your car to your coffee maker. So, if you're sitting in darkness and your trusty truck won't start, it's time to consider the possibility of an EMP. But how can you be sure? This is where a Faraday cage comes in handy. Named after the 19th century scientist Michael Faraday, a Faraday cage is a simple enclosure that can protect electronic devices from electromagnetic fields. It can be as basic as a metal trash can with a tight-fitting lid lined with insulating material. Before an EMP event, you should store a few critical electronics in your Faraday cage. A battery-powered radio, a flashlight, a spare cell phone, these are all good options. After a suspected EMP, you can reach into your Faraday cage and pull out these devices. If they turn on, you're dealing with a simple power outage. But if they're dead, you've got confirmation of an EMP. This might all seem a bit daunting, but remember, knowledge is power. Being able to confirm an EMP event gives you a crucial head start in responding effectively. It allows you to transition from wondering what's happening to taking definitive action. Knowing how to confirm an EMP is essential, but what's next? Well, that's a topic for our next scene. Stay tuned because we're about to delve into securing your home in a post-EMP world. With law enforcement potentially overwhelmed, your home is your fortress. In the wake of an EMP, the loss of order could lead to a surge in opportunistic crime. Your home is your sanctuary, your castle, and it's up to you to defend it. The first step in securing your home is to assess your current defenses. Do you have sturdy locks on your doors? Are your windows reinforced? If not, now's the time to rectify that. Deadbolts and security bars are your friends here. They act as a deterrent, making it more difficult for anyone to gain unauthorized access. Next, think about your windows. In an ideal world, they'd all be fitted with security film, a clear layer that prevents glass from shattering. If that's not an option, heavy-duty plastic sheeting or even thick blankets can be used to cover windows from the inside, preventing easy access and hiding your activities from prying eyes. Now let's talk about entrances. If you have a front yard or a backyard, consider setting up a perimeter. This could be as simple as a makeshift fence or as elaborate as a series of traps, the goal is not to harm, but to deter, to make your home seem like more trouble than it's worth. 
Remember, the best defense is a good offense. This doesn't mean you should be out patrolling with a shotgun. It means you should be prepared to protect yourself and your loved ones if necessary. This could involve learning self-defense tactics or keeping a baseball bat by your bed. It's all about creating a safe space for you and your family, a space where you feel secure. Lastly, always keep a low profile. The less attention you draw to yourself, the better. This means keeping noise to a minimum, maintaining a low light profile at night, and avoiding unnecessary interactions with others. Securing your home is about more than just physical barriers. It's about adopting the mindset of a protector, being vigilant and staying one step ahead. Your home is now secure, but what about your basic needs? Water and food, the pillars of survival. How do you ensure you have enough? In an EMP event, your pantry and faucet might not be as reliable as they are today. The first rule of thumb in such a scenario is to ration your existing supplies. It's a simple principle, really. Use less, make it last. Keep a record of what you consume each day and adjust your usage to make your supplies stretch as far as possible. Now, you might be wondering, what if my supplies run out? That's where water purification methods and long-lasting food reserves come in handy. You should have water purification tablets, a filtration system, or even a simple pot for boiling water. Remember, in a post-EMP world, clean water is more precious than gold. As for food, investing in canned goods, freeze-dried meals, and high-energy snacks like nuts and dried fruit is a smart move. These items can last for years, even decades, and provide the nutrients you need to stay healthy and strong. But let's consider the worst-case scenario. Your supplies have run dry and there's no grocery store to run to. What then? Well, you might be surprised at the resources you have right under your nose. Your water heater, for instance, holds gallons of water. If you have a swimming pool or a rainwater collection system, even better. And for food, it's time to go back to our hunter-gatherer roots. Learn about local edible plants, set up a fishing line, or even consider small game hunting. If you've got a green thumb, starting a survival garden can also provide a sustainable source of food. Remember, in a world where an EMP has rendered modern conveniences useless, resourcefulness is key. It's about making do with what you have and finding sustenance in unlikely places. With food and water secured, what about medical emergencies? That's up next, so stay tuned. In a post-EMP world, hospitals may not be an option. How do you prepare for this? Let's delve right in. First off, a well-stocked first aid kit is essential in any emergency situation, let alone after an EMP attack. Bandages, antiseptics, painkillers, tweezers, scissors, medical tape, and gloves are just a few basics that should be in your kit. Don't forget about any specific medical supplies that you or your family may need, such as inhalers or insulin. Now let's talk about knowledge. Knowing how to use these supplies correctly could be the difference between life and death. Basic medical training, like CPR and wound care, can be invaluable in an emergency. There are plenty of online resources and community classes where you can learn these life-saving skills. Remember, preparation is more than just having supplies and knowledge. You need a plan. What if someone breaks a leg or gets a severe burn? Sit down with your family or group and discuss how you'd handle these scenarios. Who's the most medically knowledgeable? They should be the primary caregiver. Who's the fastest runner? They could fetch supplies or help. Prescription medications present their own challenges. If you or a loved one relies on a daily medication, try to have a supply that can last you several months. This may not always be possible due to restrictions on certain medications, but do your best. Talk to your doctor about your concerns. They may be able to provide some solutions or alternatives. In the face of an EMP event, it's important to remember that prevention is the best medicine. Simple things like good hygiene and careful food preparation can prevent a lot of health issues. Keep your living area clean, wash your hands often, and make sure you're cooking your food thoroughly to avoid foodborne illnesses. Medical care is crucial, but so is staying connected. We'll talk about that in the next segment. Stay with us. In the silence following an EMP, how do you reach out? Some might say that in the wake of an electromagnetic pulse, silence is the most frightening sound, but that's not entirely accurate. It's the absence of communication that's truly terrifying. So how do we bridge this chasm of silence? First, let's look at the devices you've diligently protected in your Faraday cage, radios, satellite phones, or any other device that might give us a lifeline to the outside world. If you've planned well, these devices should be unaffected by the EMP and ready to put to work. But remember, it's not just about reaching out. 
It's also about gathering information, tune into any functioning frequencies, listen for news, updates, or even the comforting sound of another human voice. Next, think about the people you need to connect with, family members, friends, or those within your survival group. It's important to have a pre-established plan. Where will you meet if your home isn't safe? What if you're separated when the EMP hits? Having meeting plans and locations arranged in advance is vital. This isn't just about practicality, it's about peace of mind. In a world suddenly plunged into the dark ages, knowing where your loved ones are is a beacon of hope amid the uncertainty. But what if your protected devices fail, or you didn't have the foresight to shield anything? Don't despair. Human beings have been communicating long before the invention of electronic devices. Smoke signals, Morse code, even simple written messages can be effective ways to communicate. Creativity and adaptability are your best allies here. And then, there's the old-fashioned face-to-face conversation. There's no EMP in the universe that can wipe out the power of spoken words, of human connection, whether it's coordinating with your survival group or reaching out to the neighbor you've barely spoken to. Communication is a two-way street. Listen, share, cooperate. In the silence of an EMP-stricken world, your voice matters. Communication is key, but there's strength in numbers. Alone, we're vulnerable. Together, we're strong. This mantra rings true in our modern society, but even more so when faced with a cataclysmic event like an EMP attack. In the immediate aftermath of an EMP, you may feel isolated and scared. This is a natural response, but remember, your community is your strength. Your neighbors, your friends, your family, they're all part of your survival network. It's time to rally the troops, so to speak. Organize with those around you for mutual aid and defense. In the face of adversity, unity is the best defense. However, organizing is not just about safety and numbers. It's also about pooling resources, sharing skills, and working together to better your chances of survival. Maybe your neighbor has a green thumb and can help grow food. Perhaps another neighbor is a retired nurse who can assist with medical emergencies. Everyone has something to contribute, and every contribution increases your collective survival chances. But remember, communication is key. Establish clear roles and responsibilities. Make sure everyone knows what they're doing and what's expected of them. This is not about creating a hierarchy, but about ensuring everyone is on the same page. Also, don't forget to plan for potential conflicts. In stressful situations, tempers can flare. Have a process in place for resolving disputes and maintaining harmony in your community. And lastly, don't just hunker down. Reach out to other communities, establish alliances, share resources and information. This way, you're not just ensuring your survival, but also helping to rebuild society from the grassroots level. Remember, an EMP attack is not the end of the world, but a call to adapt, to evolve, and to come together as a community. It's a test of our resilience, our adaptability, and our humanity. And together, we can pass this test. With your community at your side, you're ready for the long haul. A world without electricity, are you ready to adapt? Now that's a question that's bound to set your mind racing. The thought of it is daunting, no doubt. But it's a reality we may need to face in the wake of an EMP attack. Transitioning to a long-term survival mindset isn't about fear. It's about resilience, adaptability, and resourcefulness. Imagine a life where the crackling fire replaces the hum of electricity, where the rhythm of nature replaces the ticking clock. It's a life that requires us to tap into age-old skills and knowledge, skills that our ancestors relied upon for survival. It's not going to be easy, but it's possible. And more importantly, it's necessary. One of the first things to consider is food. Without electricity, we're back to basics, agriculture. It's time to get your hands dirty and plant those seeds. Growing your own food isn't just practical, it's empowering. You're not just growing vegetables, you're cultivating resilience. Next, we need to talk about tools. Forget about your power tools. It's time to get acquainted with their manual counterparts. Hammers, saws, axes, these are your new best friends. They don't need electricity, they run on sweat and determination. Now, let's talk about trade. In a world without electricity, community bartering could become a primary method of obtaining goods and services. Your skills, your knowledge, your crops, these all become valuable commodities. It's about leveraging what you have to get what you need. Finally, we can't forget about the importance of learning from those who've done it before us. There are numerous historical and modern examples of communities that have thrived without the crutch of modern technology. Think of the Amish communities or remote tribes in the Amazon. 
They've managed to live harmoniously with nature using manual tools, farming, and community bartering to sustain their ways of life. Embracing a long-term survival mindset is about more than just surviving. It's about thriving. It's about recognizing our potential to adapt, to grow, and to overcome. It's about preparing ourselves for whatever the future may hold. Preparation is the key to survival. It's time to start preparing now.